Hey, everybody. So we're right at noon, Eastern time, that is. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to the August edition of the InterReach webinar series. I'm Christine Glauber. I'm the chair of the webinar se series, excuse me. Um, and before we get started, I just have a couple of really quick uh, logistics announcements. Um, as with all of our webinars, we are recording this meeting. Um, and this and all of our other webinar recordings can be found on our website. So please navigate over to interreach.org to peruse the archives. And so with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Amy Clymer. <clears throat> and I also want to say a special thanks to Bethany Larson for connecting us with Amy. A few of us in Interreach have uh, been following Amy's work for quite some time now, so it's a pleasure to have this uh, connection realized with Amy joining our webinar today. So um, Dr. Amy Clymer helps organizations increase their creativity so that they can maximize innovation. Her clients include the Mayo Clinic, Stanford University, and the Department of Homeland Security. She developed the Deliberate Creative Team Scale to help teams understand how to increase their creativity. Her TEDx talk, the Power of Deliberate Creative Teams explains her research, which led to an assessment tool used to help teams reach their creative potential. Amy is the host of the Deliberate Creative Podcast, which has over uh, 100, over 100,000 downloads. She is the designer of Climber Cards, a creativity and team building tool used to, by thousands to uh, deepen conversations and generate ideas. Amy holds a PhD in leadership and change from Antioch University and a master's degree in outdoors education from the University of New Hampshire. She is trained or certified in um, creative problem solving, immunity to change, and the foresight thinking system. In 2016, she won the Carl Ronke Creative Award from the Association for Experimental, uh, sorry, Experiential Education. And you can learn more about Amy and her work at climberconsulting.com. And that's Climber without a B. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Amy. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be here. Good to see you. Um, so today we are talking about leading engaging virtual meetings. And um, just a quick note, I'm not going to do the typical uh, like screen share, but instead, if you change your view instead of gallery view, put it in speaker view, then you'll be able to see my slides well. Um, so go ahead and find that in the upper right corner of the Zoom window. Um, if it says speaker view, then click on it, and then you'll be able to see, see me and the slides, and then doesn't it get that weird sh share screen thingy, you know? <laughs> um, so uh, I want you to, first thing I want you to do is just open up the chat box and find the chat box and, and click on uh, at the bottom where it says everyone in that little blue box. So go ahead and do that. And then I want you to, I want to know who's here. Who are you? Where are you in the world? And so I want you to answer three things all in one response. So your name, your location, where are you in the world right now? And where do you work or what do you do? Uh, I know most of you probably work at a university, but uh, throw that in there. Uh, oh yeah, and great, great point, Jennifer. You can pin, pin my video if you want in case other people are talking or there's a little chatter in the background. Um, you don't see that show up on the screen. But find the chat box, send the note to all of us. Let's see who's here today. Uh, Nicole from Michigan. Mira from Clemson, Sharon from Knoxville, Tennessee, just around the corner from me. I'm actually in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, we've got Katie from Duluth, Sarah in Seattle, David from New Jersey, welcome. Jessica, oh, Sarah from UW-Madison, hi. I used to work there. Uh, I used to live in Madison for about 15 years, so it's good to see you. Uh, David, Amalia from Durham, Melissa, Chris, oh, Sybil, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, from Switzerland. Yay, I get so excited when there's people outside of the US. I mean, I love us Americans. I love us Americans. Um, <laughs> uh, hi, Joel Scott from NASA, that's awesome. I actually had a couple people from NASA in a class that I'm leading that I'll actually talk about at the end. Um, 
All right, I'm not gonna say everyone's name here, but Alan, Jen, Lizelle, Patrice, Jessica, we got a couple people from Stanford, awesome. All right, we have Philippa from London, yay. Wow, all right, y'all are awesome. Hannah from Colorado State, sweet, love it, love it. All right, welcome everyone, I am so glad you're here. It's just good to see who's here in the room, right? Because otherwise we just end up being these like random pictures and names on the on Zoom. So. All right, so thank you for sharing. Um, I just a little bit about what to expect today. So I'm going to share with you some insights and tools and tips that you can use when you're leading virtual meetings. Um, obviously, we have been, you know, around the world, we've all been leading virtual meetings for months. Uh, at least we've been in them because, well, that's that's all we get right now for the most part. Um, so I'm going to share with you how to do those well, and a lot of actually what I'm going to share might translate well to in-person meetings. So um, I would recommend to grab some pencil and paper if you haven't already, if you need to get up and walk across the room, feel free to do that. And just have something next to you so that you could take some notes and just some little tips that you'll be able to remember later. So grab that pencil and paper and have it next to you. All right, we are going to, um, I'm going to throw up a poll. And <laughs> this picture is like, what, what, what uh, conference rooms are looking like right now? Like <laughs> really boring and empty, not very fun. Um, but I'm curious, I'm gonna throw a poll up. Just wanna know what the experience level in the group is of how, much, how many virtual meetings have you led or facilitated? I know you've been in many, but how many have you been essentially in charge of? Um, so go ahead and throw that response up really quick. And if you haven't muted yourself, go ahead and mute unless you have a question you want to throw in. Go ahead and mute yourself. All right, we've got almost everyone responded. If you are on a mobile device, you might need to click somewhere where it says poll to find the link. Hey, Christine, could you be, would you be willing to mute people that aren't muted? Just so we don't hear the background chatter. All right, I'm ending the poll. Last chance. Three, two, one. All right, let me share the results with you so you can see. Um, just nod your head if you can see those results on your screen. Yes, okay. I only see a few of you in video, so <laughs> good. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, all right, so it looks like actually uh, one person hasn't led any meetings yet. All right, whoever you are, you don't have to say, but your challenge in the next, let's say the next month, we are like midway through August. So by the end of August, I would like to challenge you to lead a meeting of some sort, even if it's just a meeting with your family, uh, but to facilitate something uh, virtually. So that's a challenge for you. But uh, most of you have actually led less than 15. We've got a couple of people with a lot of experience. Um, all right, awesome, that's really helpful. Thanks for sharing that. All right, so I want to know what challenges you have when, you're, when you are facilitating. And if you haven't facilitated yet, or you've only done one or two, um, you might uh, instead share some things that you anticipate being a challenge. We're going to do this a little bit different. I'm going to share with you a tool that I have developed called Climber Cards. And I've actually developed a virtual version of them, and we're going to use this right now. So. The way it works is I want you to think about a challenge. Just pick one challenge that you have when, you, um, when, when you're facilitating. And in the chat box, I just threw a link. And if you go there, you're gonna see something that looks like this. You're gonna see a screen and you're gonna be able to pick on a card that represents that challenge that you have. And then just put your name in and, um, and, and hit you know, a couple comments of what that challenge is and then hit respond or submit. So go ahead and find that link. In the chat box. If you're having any difficulties, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. See if people have. All right, Sarah's got her response in. All right, sweet Jessica, Melissa. All right, keep them coming. I 
And once you've submitted your response, there's another link that says something like, you know, view others' responses. And so go ahead and click on that, and then you can scroll through and see what other people have said. And I'll also have this up on the screen, and we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, all right. Th by the way, this is a prototype. And you can tell because here's one image that isn't showing up properly. So Christine, I'm sorry, I don't know which image that was, but um, all right, I'm just gonna read a few of these out loud. Um, so David says, keeping people engaged in creative ways, he's using the I. Um, ooh, Christine says, a prickly person who will not honor the process and may be too important to respond to crowd cues or gentle redirects. Yeah, sometimes you have to be um, the gentle Part of the redirect doesn't work, right? Alexia says, I feel like I'm being pulled in many directions. Um, Sarah says, it represents connecting between meeting participants. Whoops. Uh, sometimes that can be difficult to facilitate virtually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mira says, attendance seems low, inviting, reminding, but dot, dot, dot. Yeah, okay. Melissa says, I don't see the audience's responses. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge. So here's an invitation to you all if you're interested, um, is to turn on your video uh, just you know, for today. I, that may, you may not have known that, so if you're in your pajamas, okay, you can have a pass. But uh, I would love to be able to see your faces, uh, speaking of engaging and, and um, connecting with each other. And I imagine that some of you know each other just from either this community or other overlap. And then also some of you probably don't know each other. And so this is kind of a, a way to help with that, um, even though there'll be limited interaction between you. Anyway, this is helpful. This is helpful just to see some of the challenges that you have um, when facilitating virtually. All right, oops, yeah. So I'm gonna try to address some, uh, quite a few of those today. And there should be time at the end for a little q and I have to get off about 50 after the hour. Um, and so, and then I know that Christine and Bethany have some announcements at the end, but so let's talk about virtual meetings. So what I have noticed in the work that I've done from, with myself and with my clients is that meetings fall on this continuum. And at the very bottom are those virtual meetings that are just painful. Uh, and hopefully we get, we avoid those, but they're there, right? They're just, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I, I'll, sometimes I have, I have felt almost in physical pain because I have to sit in this meeting and it just is just irrelevant, boring, uh, doesn't, I should, I don't even need to be there. Uh, you know, it's an hour long meeting. It could have been something that was sent a, in a 10 minute email or, and instead we're just wasting time. Um, so then we get to these meetings that I think of as they're tolerable, like it's okay, I get it, we, we need to be there, but again, it doesn't feel like it's really worthwhile. And yeah, and then we get to ones that I'm like, okay, this is a good meeting, it's fine. And then eventually when meetings are really well led and really well designed, they actually can be better than in person. And this may sound um, a bit unexpected, but I've, I've experienced, and just throw in the, the chat, if you have been in a meeting, a virtual meeting, that you felt like, wow, this was actually better than an in-person meeting. Just throw a yes in the chat if you've seen that, if you've had that experience. Or, or actually, okay, I see a couple of people. Awesome, awesome. So we, all, we know that it can happen. It's not common. I'm curious, um, where do you find most of the meetings you're a part of, whether you're a participant or you're a, um, or you're a facilitator, where would they fall on this, this spectrum? And go ahead and just throw that in the chat. Would they be painful, tolerable, better than in person? Where are they? Okay. All right, I'm seeing lots of tolerables, a few goods, That's, I'm, I'm glad. Tolerable to good, a few painfuls. Yeah, okay, I'm not seeing, well, we've all had the experience of better than in person, it's not necessarily the norm, and uh, hopefully we will get there. All right, so it sounds like there's definitely a lot of room to grow. Um, so then the question is like, well, why bother? And I think at this point in our pandemic, we've recognized that we're in this for a while. You know, this isn't ending next month. Uh, we're gonna be having virtual meetings for, I would think, you know, depending on your context, the rest of the year at least. Uh, you might still have some things in person, but the thing is, even when this is over, 
and we can be a hundred percent back in person and we don't have to worry about catching COVID or I, mean, I don't know what that's going to look like. But anyway, once this is over, we will continue to have virtual meetings more than we ever have in the past. So just to give you some numbers, in December of 2019, there were 10 million uses on Zoom. So like right now, this would count as about 50 uses because there's, well, there's 55 people here. So 10 million in December. In March, there were 200 million. That's when the pandemic hit. And then in April, there were 300 million uses of Zoom. So we are never going back to that December number of just 10 million uses a month because now we all get it. We know how this works and we will forever moving forward have more virtual meetings than we ever have in the past, even when we can meet in person because we all know how to do it now, right? And, and there's so many benefits to it. Uh, you know, there's no commuting. It's simple. You can gather a group of people from all over the world pretty quickly and easily at almost no cost. So there's so many benefits of it that we have to get good at these skills. This is not a short-term need, it's huge. And just to do some quick, simple math for you, um, and th this, this actually is something that I get just really passionate about, whether it's in-person or virtual, is that I have seen countless organizations waste money on irrelevant, boring, just, ineffective meetings. Um, I used to work at, I've worked at more than one university and I actually think universities might be one of the bigger culprits uh, because, you know, we have all these committees and we get together and, you know, and, and there's a lot of benefit to that. The, the collaboration can be really valuable, but often I think those meetings aren't the best use of our time. So let's imagine there's 10 people that show up at a meeting for one hour and just for simple math, the average salary of that group of people is $100,000, which works out to about $50 an hour. So 50, 10 people at $50 an hour is $500 an hour. So that meeting is costing you $500 just for 10 people to show up and sit there. And so my question is, are you facilitating in a way that it's actually $500 worth of value? So is the conversation rich enough? Is the, uh, the content important enough? Or could this have, been, this have happened over a quick video email or email? Um, I was in an email yesterday, or excuse me, I was in a meeting yesterday with a, a committee that I'm a part of for a national association. And I, I'm fairly new to this group. It's about 10 people in this committee. And we show up and the way the meeting was designed, there was no email sent in advance about what the topic was. There were, we, none of us were asked to prepare in, in anything in advance. And so 45 minutes of the meeting was people just reporting this really base level information that could have been easily shared in an email in advance. And then we could have gotten into like a really rich conversation. And at the end of the meeting, actually somebody said, hey, are we gonna have a conversation before we make a decision on this issue? And the facilitator had not planned on that. I'm like, okay, well then why are we even coming together? We, you, do you know what I'm saying? Um, and so it's, it's thinking about how do you design the meeting uh, so that it actually is valuable and you're getting your $500 or $1,000 or whatever it is, you're getting your money's worth of time. Um, how many of you, I want you to throw in the chat, do you feel like, like yes, no, do you feel like the meetings that you're a part of are getting the value of everybody there every time you show up? No, 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 no. Okay, I'm seeing all. No, okay, not really. <laughs> Laugh out loud, no. Usually, okay, awesome, Alan, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, not every time, yes, yeah, some of the times, right? I mean, gosh, I hope so. Uh, but there's a lot of no's in there, okay. All right, so let's talk about how do we get there? Um, All right, so these are three elements that I have noticed, I've identified that are critical for excellent virtual meetings. Technology, design, and delivery. So we're gonna talk about each of these three. We're gonna go into a little bit more depth on these, but I want, and I want you to think about uh, where do you need the most help? Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But so technology is just basically, you need to know and you know how to use the technology, know how to use it well, really be able to capitalize on it. 
design, I think of as what happens before you show up. So what thought and preparation are you putting into designing the meeting? And then delivery is what happens in the moment. So the actual interactions and how that's being facilitated. And the intersections of these three uh, concepts I think are interesting as well. So the intersection between technology and design, that's a place of inspiration. And so for instance, the climber cards that I just put up there, and I'll, I'll talk at the end about how you can access those. Um, now that's a piece of technology that you can access. And when you're thinking about designing, if you're thinking, oh, I know, let's use, let's use these climber cards in order to uh, facilitate some conversation, that may inspire things for you. So that's just an example where you know the technology, then it can help you with the design. And then there's an intersection between design and delivery. And to me, that is a place of innovation. Uh, it's also a place of exploration where you can really play with, okay, how am I gonna deliver this? And, and, and sometimes you're really going back and forth. You might be adjusting the design in the moment. Um, and then finally, that delivery, that intersection between delivery and technology, that's a place of transformation, especially if it's a well-designed, well-delivered meeting where, I mean, a good meeting like has a really positive impact on a group of people or on a project or you're getting results There's some sort of transformation happening. And I think of these as almost like a, a process where they all connect together. Um, and so you can kind of see that line if you imagine it going around clockwise. So I want you to think about um, where do you need the most help and the most guidance, or where, where, I guess, where do you feel like you need the most growth? That's a better word. So throw in the chat, which of these areas do you feel like you need the most growth as you think about the meetings that you're facilitating? All right, I'm seeing design, oops. All right, design, delivery, technology, innovation. All right, so kind of a good blend, virtual design, technology, yeah, all right, cool. Seems like fairly split. Um, just at a quick glance. Maybe technology is the smallest, but okay, good to know. All right, so let's, um, I'm going to start off with technology. We won't spend a ton of time here. I'm certainly not going to talk about how to use Zoom. I mean, obviously at this point, we got the basics down. Um, so I want to talk about just a few little tips, a few things to think about that in the clients that I've worked with, this is something they've struggled with or, or else it's been really helpful for them. So Thinking about technology, uh, just a quick, easy tip. And I actually, I'm looking at your videos. Some of you are already doing this fairly well. Um, oh, actually, before I talk about that, what I was gonna say is just, I want, think about your technology attitude. What I have noticed is that people across the spectrum of age, so I'm not even going to blame, you know, boomers or traditionalists here, but I have seen this from millennials, Gen Z, is just this really bad attitude about technology. And this attitude of like, oh, no, I'm not good at it. I, I suck. Uh, I can't learn this. This is too hard. No, like all of you are intelligent this is not difficult. It might take some time to learn it and it might take some practice and it might take, you know, a little effort, but it is not difficult necessarily. Um, you have the capabilities and the skills to learn to use this technology well. Um, so my first thing is just like check your own attitude and make sure that you're not just being like, I don't know, a real sourpuss about it. Um, so check your technology attitude and embrace it because it, I, I don't know, I get excited about it because I think that there's so much potential. Um, all right, another a quick tip here is I want you to think about your video camera. And if you don't have an external video camera, like say if you just have your laptop, highly, highly recommend buy, buying an external camera. Now, back in April, you pretty much could not buy one of these in the United States because they were just snatched up so fast. But now the supply has come back around, um, and so you can actually get one of these now. I want you to move your camera so that it is, it is at eye level. Um, I'm actually standing up right now, and so I have my camera up on a tripod on my desk so that it's at my eye level. And I actually, I always present and facilitate standing up, and most of the day I work from a stand-up desk, so that's another thing I would recommend. Um, but move your camera up to eye level. So let me show you why. So let me just actually get off my slides. So here I am at eye level. So let me show you what happens when I change my camera. Will this work? Yeah. Okay. So right now, 
you're seeing me with my laptop camera. And instead it's like, I am just like looming over you. I mean, you're like looking at my nose. I mean, this is not pretty, right? That's not what you wanna do. So instead, let me move my camera back. Uh, move, move your camera up to eye level. So super, super simple, uh, quick, easy fix. This is just going to make you look more professional, come across more professional. And, and, and actually, I think it helps with connection because, um, yeah, we were, and then the other thing is just to look in the camera. So if, uh, as I'm looking right in the camera lens, it's making it feel like, um, possibly making it feel like I'm looking right at you. And at first this will feel really awkward and eventually it'll get quite comfortable. Um, I actually was presenting a couple of weeks ago, actually at the University of Wisconsin, and this particular webinar, for whatever reason, uh, they didn't want to use video. It was actually odd because it was a technology group, but for whatever reason, they didn't want to use video. And so I, they just could see my slides. And I realized about midway through that I am so used to now looking at the video camera that it actually felt awkward to not look at the camera. It was like I was ignoring them or something, even though they couldn't even see me. Um, so you can get pretty comfortable with it, even though it'll feel a little odd at first. Um, all right, so that's a quick, easy thing. The other thing that uh, I know is a concern for a lot of people is that something will go wrong. And they're just worried that something's going to wrong, go wrong, and you know what? It will. I promise you that something will go wrong at some point. So the challenge is you just gotta be prepared. I'll just share with you an example of something that went horribly wrong when I was facilitating a five-hour program. Uh, this was last month. Well, I was in June, it's about six weeks ago. And I was, uh, I was I'm part of an association and I was facilitating a five hour training for them that day. And I was presenting for about an hour and a half, but the rest of the time I was hosting and I was facilitating. And the training started around nine. And so I'm like, oh, you know, I'm gonna get there about 8.45, you know, get all logged in and everything. And, and um, about 7.50, eight o'clock in the morning, I realize, we have no internet in our house. And I text my neighbors like, you guys have internet? They're like, nope, we don't have any either. And uh, so I, none of my immediate neighbors had internet. And I'm like, so I immediately sent a note to our, the president of our group saying, hey, can you host the meeting? I'm gonna be late, here's what's going on. So he did, really easy, quick fix. And then I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get internet? Uh, now, typically what I might do is use my hotspot on my phone, but for whatever reason, the cell service was super slow and I wasn't even able to load a website, much less use a hotspot. So I eventually uh, contact another, a friend who lives about half a mile away and, I'm, and I find out she does have internet. She had a different internet provider than we did. So I drive over to her house and I sit in her driveway because of course we're in COVID, I can't really go into her house. So I sit in her driveway, use her Wi-Fi, and I start facilitating the meeting from the back seat of my car. Okay, <laughs> it's like, 80 degrees outside, I'm getting really hot. Um, and I don't have all the normal things I have. I just have my laptop. And I was supposed to present in the morning and I switched with the afternoon presenter thinking, okay, by midday, maybe the internet will be back. Well, it wasn't. And so at noon, I went home and I grabbed all of my stuff that I needed, my camera, my external monitor, my laptop, my mic, everything. And I went back over to my friend's house and I set it up in her, in her, um, on her front porch. And I mean, it was just like super stressful. Um, and what ended up happening, I later found out is that there was a massive fire at this huge apartment complex in our house, in our town and 80,000 people lost internet. Like, there's no way, like, how are you going to plan for something like that? And it ended up actually, I mean, I was, you know, I was like super stressed all day. My adrenaline's all over the place, right? But to the participant, it actually didn't end up being that big a deal. Like, I was able to still deliver a fairly seamless program. Um, and it was only because I knew and understood the technology well. So I, it was no big deal for me to unplug everything, throw it in my car, and then replug it all up again. So just being able to use the technology well um, can, can help you punt in those moments when you need to. Um, anybody else had any like crazy experiences like that? Okay, cool. I have <laughs>
Uh, yeah, Alan, Alan Paul, uh, I don't know if you meant to only send this to me, Alan, but he added a note about eye level and going slightly above eye level is a little bit more flattering and it can also help present, prevent glare on glasses. I mean, that probably depends a bit on where your, your light is coming from, but thanks, Alan. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about design. The, the biggest thing I would say when you're, when you're thinking about a meeting is just think about what's the purpose of it. And this sounds so overly obvious. And at the same time, I am really kind of sad, saddened by how rarely this is actually considered. Uh, the meeting that I was in yesterday, if they had really thought through what the purpose was, the purpose was for us to get to where we can make a decision about something. Like it was not designed for that. And so thinking about what the purpose is and then really designing the meeting to meet that purpose and thinking about what can you do outside of the meeting what beforehand that will help that meeting go better. I mean, when I look at a meeting, I think of the purpose, the bigger purpose of the meeting is that we've got a bunch of smart people together. We've got all these brains. Let's actually use them for the sake of collaboration. And that if it's just about like delivering information, now sometimes you do need to do that in a meeting format. I'm not saying you should never do that, but can you deliver that in another way? Can people quickly read that in email? Can you send a quick email video? Um, there's so many tools and so many different ways you can do that today, um, but how can you have people show up and really um, use that time well? And I think, you know, you could borrow the concept from the classroom of the flipped, the flipped classroom where, and this is becoming more and more common now, especially since the pandemic, where professors are sending videos out in advance and saying, hey, I want you to watch these videos about the content. And then when we get together, we're actually going to talk through it and, and, act, and do the, basically do the homework in class and do the, the knowledge gathering or the knowledge learning outside of class. And so thinking about that in your meeting can, can have a really positive impact. Um, uh, I'm just noticing in the chat, uh, Nicole says the breakout rooms were all deleted and then had to recreate them in the meeting. Yeah, which can be really stressful if you have these deliberate groups you're trying to set up and you have a big group. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Bethany says, you know, as far as deliberate design, it's like the backward design for the classes. Absolutely, right? So thinking about the purpose first, what, what's the outcome of the course? It's the exact same thing with the meeting. Right? So, I mean, this isn't rocket science, but it's just not something we think about very often. Um, so I would just encourage you to think about that. One other design tip to think about is think about, is there a way you can facilitate connection before you get into that content? Uh, or better yet, even have uh, the connection, some time to, for people to connect with each other, align with the content. Um, so just as an example, you know, I did the climber cards at the beginning as a way to help uh, I mean, in this case, we're not all connecting with each other, but there's some connection happening, but it's aligned with the, the topics that we're talking about and the content of the meeting. A nice change. Nice change. Um, I'm just going to mute Christine on that. Um, uh, one of my coaching clients was telling me this story where right after COVID, you know, when it first started about late March, um, early April, one of the first meetings after with the executive team that she was a part of, the CEO that was running the meeting, like did nothing to facilitate any connection. It was just like, hi everyone. Okay, let's jump right in. And here it's like, um, we just like experienced this global pandemic and we just like, we've been working from home for one week and we don't know, you know, and everybody's like anxious and freaked out. And, and my client said it was actually really difficult to pay attention and stay engaged because it just felt like that everybody was being ignored and everyone's needs are being ignored. And so that's maybe an extreme example, but when people connect with each other, they actually engage with the content better. Um, so think about that. How can you do that? And at the same time, don't get really cheesy about, oh, let's have this icebreaker and everybody share where their favorite vacation has been. Unless you're like doing something around travel, you're part of the study abroad office, that might feel really frivolous. And generally adults have a low tolerance for that kind of thing. Uh, it depends on the group. If you're in res life, yeah, there's going to be a higher tolerance, um, but make whatever connection, whatever activity you're doing relevant to the content and relevant to the group. 
Um, does that make sense? Okay, I'm seeing a few head nods, cool. All right. All right, so those are a few thoughts about design. Um, let's look at delivery. So uh, one of my a coaching clients who's also been in a couple of my courses, uh, Regina King, she's a creativity expert and she consults on dental practices. Uh, she says, I've learned how important it is to relax and be yourself. Connection with your group is so much easier that way. And it is so true. Um, so when you're thinking about the delivery, think about uh, just, especially if it's, you know, a high stakes thing or you're trying something new and maybe you're a little bit nervous, just be yourself. That's what, that's why you're there. That's why you're part of this team is because you're bringing your amazingness, your brain and your insights. And that's what people want. Um, and so being yourself is going to be a way for you to bring your best self to the group. Um, yeah. So just be you. The other thing to think about when you're thinking about delivery is to think about the energy that you're bringing into the group. And <laughs> so I have this online class, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. It's about leading engaging virtual meetings. And there's a video in there that I did about energy. And so I'm, I'm, this, I, I made this class back in April, so I'm recording the video and I'm like, oh, well, this video is about energy. So I better just like show up and just be like over the top. And so I'm recording this video and I'm feeling actually quite foolish because it just, I mean, I'm an energetic person, but I was just like really hamming it up. Right. And then I watched the video after I made it and it did not look near as energetic as it felt to me. And it was a reminder of something that I had heard that about 40% of your energy just goes into the camera and just get lost into the like outer space of the internet. And so whatever energy you're seeing from me right now is probably only about 60% of, of what I'm actually putting out. Um, and so think about that when you're facilitating, particularly at the beginning of the meeting. Now I'm not saying that every time you need to show up and just be like, Whoa, hey everybody, welcome, because that might not fit with the content or the purpose, but if you're like all slumped in your chair and be like, hey everyone, throw your name in the chat, like people are gonna check out, right? Um, so thinking about how you show up, um, it's amazing just like the mirror that you get back um, representing how you show up. So anybody seen this either in themselves or the other people, raise your hand. Yeah, I'm seeing some hands out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. All right, good. Um, all right. So we, I've just like, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. We actually have gone fairly quick. So what I want to do is I'm just going to throw this back up. Oops. And I want you to think about, um, given some of the things that you've heard, I want you to throw any questions you have right now in the chat. We're just going to open it up for questions. Or if you're like, oh, I don't really want to write this out and you want to unmute yourself, um, just raise your hand like in front of the camera and then I can call on you. And let's just open it up for conversation about what questions do you have about making your online meetings awesome? Oh, uh, we'll go Evangeline and then Jessica. Evangeline. Okay. Seeing your cool. name right? Yeah, actually. Yeah. That's unusual. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, I, I have to create a lot of webinars for faculty who are doing research um, cross campus. And so I'm not the one who gives the content. I'm more host and handle Q&A and stuff. And I find that a lot of times the speakers I bring in, I don't know what their energy level is going to be when they get there. And we could start here and once they start talking, it becomes it's like, oh, wow, this is tanking. Is there, is there a way like we can help avoid that? I mean, help them be more comfortable, you know, when mm -hmm. you have a speaker that you're not quite sure of? Yeah. Um, just curious, anybody else dealing with this? It's definitely not uncommon. Raise your hand if you're dealing with this. I see some head nods. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think... This is, yeah, I've gotten this question many times. And so a couple thoughts about this. One is I think part of your role is in preparing the presenter, especially it sounds like, you know, you're, you're dealing with researchers where that's their primary job is to research. And then secondarily, or maybe tertiary or whatever is, oh yeah, I got to share this with people. 
Um, and so that's not necessarily their strength and maybe it's not even anything they care about, who knows? Um, so I think in advance, preparing them, and there's a number of ways to do this. You could just have a simple, you know, one pager that you send out to them or maybe a page on a website. It's like, hey, here's some tips. Um, I mean, even thinking, even telling them like, put your camera at eye level, stand up. I, just those two things, actually the stand up particularly, will help change their energy. That's why I don't present sitting down. I wouldn't present in person. Like I would never give a keynote from a stage sitting down. So why would I come and do a webinar sitting down when it's, you know, I want that similar thing. I wouldn't do a training sitting down unless it was like something, you know, a small intimate group. Um, so that would be one thing. Ask them in advance if they can, you know, put your laptop up on a cardboard box. It doesn't have to be fancy. No one's going to see it. Um, so I think giving them, them some tips to help them can be really helpful. Um, and again, that could be like a one pager. You could make a quick video that they watch. Um, by the way, I'm going to throw in the chat here, a tool that I use a lot to make videos. It's called Vidyard, vidyard.com free, free tool. You can make this quick, simple video. You just hit play. It automatically uploads. It gives you a link, everything. And then you can just dump it into an email and say, Hey, watch this video. Uh, you know, and I, I keep it short, you know, two, three minutes is my recommendation, but, um, so those are a couple tips of Angeline. And then the other thing is maybe get on a practice call with them ahead of time and, you know, ask them to give 15 minutes of their presentation just so you get a feel for it and then give them some feedback, especially if it's something maybe more high stakes where you really want it to go well. So is that helpful? Okay, cool. I see a big smile. Awesome. All right, Jessica, you're next. Good afternoon. It's morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, yeah, where are you? <laughs> Um, it's actually morning for me, but it feels like next week. Anyway, the um, challenge I'm facing is we are putting together um, a training for faculty that's um, happening once a month, mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be in person. And um, those natural networking that happens in in-person events are not going to be there. We have created what we're calling coffee chats or stole it from you from insights um, to um, <laughs> um, but that's added time that we don't expect everybody to be at. Okay. My main question, we start the entire thing. We want everybody to introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to do that virtually? So it flows mm -hmm. and the challenge is so Many of the faculty that I work with like to talk about themselves and their work, and we have 32 people. Mm. But we don't have time for everybody to just give their five, 10 minutes feel. Any tips would be gratefully appreciated. <laughs> yes, okay, great question. Uh, again, who, who else is dealing with this issue? Anybody else? Okay, I see a few hands up. Yeah, great. Okay, so first off, do not do introductions of everyone with 32 people via Zoom. Like, it, I mean, everyone, and even if it's 30 seconds a piece, that's still 15 minutes and that's a long time. Unless if this is a group that like, they're going to be together, the same group for a long time, you know, several months, maybe that would make sense. But in general, I recommend avoiding that. Um, what I do in that context is send them into breakout rooms, but here's how you want to do the breakout rooms. Um, you want to put very clear instructions on a slide on the screen of what they're going to do in the breakout room. So in the breakout room, you're going to share your name, where you work and two sentences about what you do or, you know, whatever it is, like you want to be very specific. And what I often do is say we do a breakout room with three people, which I find is a nice number. Um, I assign, I have one of the people to volunteer to be the timer, just somebody who has a phone next to them that can turn it on, who can just time, you know, put a two minute timer on. And I talk about how the timer is for two purposes. One, the obvious, which is that someone doesn't go over and everybody has time to share. But the second is actually that people fill the full two minutes and share enough about themselves. Because, you know, sometimes there's the person that like, ah, I gotta hurry. And they only go 15 seconds when it's like, hey, we wanna know a little bit more about you. And so I explain all of that. And then I tell them who's gonna go first. And so I usually do something fun like whoever has the shortest hair or whoever's 
you know, has the, uh, is the tallest or it's just something silly that, you know, is kind of arbitrary. Um, and so though, then I have that person goes first. So then when they get in the room, they're not like, Hey, who wants to go first? Um, you know, unless you have like three bald people, then maybe they have to figure that out. But you know, then that's also kind of funny for them. Um, so just being very clear about the directions and sending them in breakout rooms and then, you know, they can come back. And what happens if you send them in breakout rooms early within the first 15 minutes, now they've got a connection with one or two other people and they come back and they're more likely to talk and engage with the, the full group. I don't know if that's a challenge in your context. Maybe you actually want them to talk less. Um, but those are a couple tips. Um, you know, again, they don't get to meet everybody, but at least they get to meet a couple of people. Um, so, and you could do that for, you know, that you could do a similar format for the coffee chat, the whole thing. Um, all right. I'm going to take a, is that helpful, Jessica? Yeah. Okay. David, yeah, I see your hand, you. but let me, let me look at the chat real quick and then and see. Uh, okay. Just let me follow up a couple of these real quick. I'm not going to get to all of them. Um, just a couple of things about technology. So Andrea, you asked if I use a ring light. No, I don't. Um, I've got some other lighting, but everything I own, every lighting thing I have is from the hardware store. Um, so I've just kind of situated it in a way that works well for me. Um, oh, there's another one in here I was going to answer. Oh yeah. Courtney says, I wonder how to look into the camera and still be able to see others' faces. Yeah. Good question. So, um, you can't in that moment, right? Like I can't look at the camera. Now my camera's right above the, the screen. So I might be able to see out the corner of my eye if somebody's like going like this. I'm like, oh wait, okay. Michelle, you have a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I am looking down on occasion and looking at people's faces. So the idea is maybe, you know, 80% of the time you're looking at the camera, 20% of the time you're looking down. Um, it's just like a conversation at a coffee shop. I'm not staring into the person's eyes 100% of the time I'm talking to them, but for the most part, I'm looking at their face. And then there may be a moment where I like look off to the side. And um, so I would say, you know, 70, 80% of the time, try to look at the camera lens. What I do though, is when I'm listening to someone, then I do look at their face. Um, I find that's helpful. But then when I'm speaking, I'm more likely to look into the camera, um, if that helps. All right. Um, I want to wrap up here. And then if there's another moment or two at the end for questions, then um, David, unless your question was just super quick, you had a little disappointed look on your face. <laughs> um, I could ask it quickly and then you could decide if you want to answer okay, cool. it later. Um, so I facilitate a lot of meetings, and one of the things that I'm aware of is that in virtual meetings, it's much harder to pick up on the physical cues of participants that I normally would rely on, people leaning forward, partially raising their hand, that kind of thing. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice about how to um, accommodate that limitation. Sure. Yeah, um, I know that's definitely a common challenge. And why I'm while I'm answering David's question, I want you to throw in the chat your response to this question on the screen. What is one change you want to make in your next online meeting, whether that's this afternoon or next week, the one that you're facilitating. So what's a change you want to make. Um, so David, as far as body language goes. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. It's a big challenge. And one of the challenges is there's actually like this microsecond delay between somebody's facial expression when they make it and when I receive it. So that just complicates things even more that we don't intellectual, like we don't logically see it, but we can intuitively notice that difference, um, which is one of the reasons why actually Zoom meetings can be tiring is because we're spending a lot of energy trying to read other people. Um, so a couple things I would recommend. First of all, just because someone looks like this, it doesn't mean they're not paying attention or engaged, okay? People don't have to be like looking all like, you know, puppy dog in order to look like they're, or in order to actually be engaged. So I guess what I'm saying is don't overread it. Um, and, and there's some other ways you'll need to get clues about whether or not people are engaged or not. I also don't assume that just because someone has their camera off, they're not engaged. I mean, over half of you have your camera off. My assumption is you would have left by now is if you, if you weren't engaged, right? So I'm, I'm, so I guess part of it is like, I'm presuming positive intentions. Um, and then the other thing is like right now I have all of you in gallery mode, but because I'm presenting and I want to be able to see as many people, but I can't see you that well. And so if, if this was a different context, more of a meeting format, 
I put you, I put, try to use speaker mode more so that whoever is talking, I can see more of their face. So it's just bigger. Um, and, or maybe I'll switch back and forth between gallery and speaker mode. Um, and then I just try to use other cues, you know, or I ask questions. Um, I mean, even just right now, I noticed I was like, yeah, we're going to move on. And then I kind of saw this subtle facial expression of yours. I'm like, okay, I think that might've been a moment of disappointment there. Let me just go back. Right. Um, I don't, I don't have a perfect answer for it, but I think just using some other things like, let me check in, um, you know, uh, Aaron, how are you doing? You're not looking engaged right now. I'm, it's not sure you really are, but just, you know, checking in and, and asking in different ways can be helpful. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, is that helpful, helpful, David, a little bit? Cool. Awesome. All right. I see some awesome ideas standing up, engaging the team earlier, breakout rooms, climber cards. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Eye contact. Cool. Good. All right. So I want to share with you some resources for where you can get some more information uh, and just more ideas. More. We just barely scratched the surface here. Um, on the screen, there is a, uh, a link. Christine, would you mind dropping that link in the chat? Um, so clamorcards, or excuse me, clamorconsulting.com slash virtual. If you go there, you can share with me your name and your email address, and I will send you uh, an email with just like a bunch of stuff uh, with some links to some other resources. Um, so that's one resource for you. Another recommendation is to check out this book by Donna McGeorge. She's actually out of Australia. Um, the 25 minute meeting. And she basically talks about how do you take a 60 minute meeting and cut it in half almost to be 25 minutes. And it doesn't apply to every single meeting, but it applies to many of them. And, it, and she talks a lot about the design and how you can um, do some pre-work and send pre-work out. And um, I know, uh, you know, like when I'm participating in meetings, I really appreciate it when people spend that time and do that. So highly recommend her book. Um, just curious, has anybody read this book? It's fairly new. I think it only just came out maybe 2019 or late 2018. Um, and then I also wanted to share with you this online course that I have. Uh, I launched it back in April because I kept getting like all these emails from clients and colleagues and friends saying, Amy, I know you, had a, you know how to do this virtual thing and I don't know what I'm doing. This is not Zoom 101, but this is really about how do you do this well? Um, it's a really robust course. And registration is open now for the September cohort. So when you, um, when you join the course, let me just walk through what you get for it. Um, so it's designed for really anybody who's facilitating meetings or trainings. We, it, we go into both of those topics. Um, and when you register, you get immediate access and there are, I wanna say 50 modules. So it's, it's definitely a lot, but it's one of those that you can pick and choose and, and you know, engage with what you need. Um, I mean, some of the modules are literally just a two minute video, so it's not, uh, not I don't think too overwhelming. Um, and then you also get a private community. Whoops, sorry. Oops. Oh, anyway, that didn't show up. Um, yeah, okay, so there's uh, these modules with videos. Uh, there's about 45 videos in there that I've created on all sorts of different topics that related to design, technology, and delivery. Um, there's a three group mastermind sessions with me. These are live group sessions that uh, a place for you to come and, sh and say, hey, I'm stuck with this or I have this problem, but they're kind of like in-depth Q&A sessions. Um, and so those are happening in September. And then there's also a private community of everybody who's ever taken the class. And that's a place where you can go in and ask questions and, hey, I'm thinking of buying this bike. Has anybody used it before? Or um, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in that, it costs $2.97 for the basic level, and there's a couple higher levels that you can look at if you're interested. Um, if there are two or more people from your organization that want to take this, shoot me an email, and I will give both of you $100 off. So send me an email of who you are, your name, and I will send you a coupon code so you can both take it for $100 off. I'll be happy to do that for you all. Um, and this was a student that was in the course, Misty. She says, Amy's courses are worth every penny, which I feel like is just a, a huge, huge compliment. Um, so the link for that course is in the bottom there in the chat, and you can also find it on my website on climberconsulting.com. Um, so if you're interested in that, register, uh, you'll get immediate access, and then you'll be like all set, ready to go for the um, online session, the live sessions in September. 
So there's a little view of what the course looks like. Um, all right. I can probably, I'm just going to take one more quick look at the chat and see if there's something quick I can answer. I have a, I have a coaching group that's starting in five minutes. So let me just take a look here. Um, Mm. <laughs> Jen, Jen Davison asked the question, have you seen an example of non-structured, non-facilitated online time for connection, or at least a successful example of it? Um, I have actually, uh, not very often, but a couple times. Um, there's this, actually that crazy, ridiculous five-hour meeting that I was leading a while ago. One of the things that we did is that at lunchtime, we invited people, so there was, you know, 12 to one, full hour for lunch, and uh, invited people that if they wanted to like go grab lunch and bring it to their computer and turn on their video and camera, they could. So we just left the meeting going. Um, I, I didn't stay. In fact, I was the one driving around getting my equipment all together. Uh, but we invited people like, turn your mic off, turn your, you know, mute yourself, turn your video off if you're walking away. But if you're here, just stay and chat. And, and people did. Um, there was probably... 25 people on that meeting and I don't know, maybe like five or 10 stuck around, uh, not a huge number. Um, another thing that I've seen that I've occasionally used, and this only works with a group if you really trust them, and that is you can set up breakout rooms and you can label breakout rooms with, you know, say a different topic and then send people to breakout rooms, just randomly send them there. And then you can, um, actually before you send them into breakout rooms, make everybody a co-host and if you are a co-host, you can move between breakout rooms. And so um, you could send everyone to the room and then they could actually go and move around to different rooms if they're a co-host. So again, that's only, you're only gonna do that if you trust people to like not end the meeting by mistake or, um, but it, it, it actually can be really fun and people can just um, be like, hey, great talking to you, I'm going to another group and then they can head out. Um, so those are two quick ideas. All right, y'all, I hope this is helpful. I hope this gives you some ideas to make your meetings amazing and go rock them. Um, love to stay in touch. So uh, Christine put those links in the chat, um, but reach out to me if I can help you in any way. Um, so yeah, y'all have a great day. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye, thanks so much, Amy. Thank of course. You. Awesome, thank you guys so much. If you've got another second, um, we, just have a quick announcement. Christine, do you want to make that announcement? Sure. Um, thanks, everyone. That was such an engaging, fantastic session. I'm so glad Amy Clymer was willing to, to join and give us all that. Um, the quick announcement is that uh, from a lot of folks in the community, uh, we have realized that we all enjoy and yet cannot seem to set aside time for reading some of the literature in the science of team science field, convergence, different methods, this type of thing. Some of us are engaged in it, the Amy Climbers of the world who live and breathe and teach it, and some of us are somewhat adjacent to it and want to absorb as much as possible. So what we decided to do is to, on the every other week, sort of on the, uh, um, there's an easier way to say this than what I am. Every two, every month, two weeks after the interreach webinar, we are thinking of holding a, um, a journal club where we would just read a paper and talk about it. And maybe that will be something that is, um, you know, a, a variety of different things that might be of interest to us. But what we wanna do is do what we did from the very, very start of the interreach community and make sure that it's all of your idea. So um, be on the lookout for a follow-up email for, uh, that will include a Google form to suggest papers or pieces that you think are seminal or that we've gotta read. And we'll start with the, the most popular uh, the things that rise to the very top, and then we can figure out a way. Um, but we're just going to pilot doing that once a month, too, offset by two weeks from the interreach webinar. That's it. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, that's going to be really exciting. So um, the webinar will be the fourth, or sorry, the second Tuesday of the month. I'm messing it up now. And then the journal club would be the fourth Tuesday of the month. So Hopefully that all works and hopefully you guys um, join us with that. We'll be sending around that Google form um, in the next few days. So thank you all for participating today and for calling in. We look forward to next month. Ciao.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.